so welcome everyone. Um, so this is a, a call which we don't have Lee today, unfortunately. Um, so you've got me again. Uh, and the purpose of today is to go through this document uh, and hopefully uh, chat through what are um, obviously the, the tax implications which we, we previously have been raised on this call and, and hopefully we've got some solutions to now in this document um, and they obviously have implication for everybody involved. Um, so this is the last of, I think, the major outstanding issues. So if we're all happy with this today, um, then the next step will be to just get this in uh, in the same form into the uh, spec um, and the spec will then be updated with the, this and the last uh, of the uh, of the previous from the previous calls the last of the changes we had it's mentioned there too um, my plan before this call was to get a spec ready uh, as you can see from the size of this document it turns out that the the remaining changes for the tax issues are nine pages so I thought rather than circulating something enormous uh, with even even more enormous with nine pages of useful stuff in there thought this might be better to focus our attention on uh, and then if we got agreement on this then everything else in the spec I think we've already talked through at length so um, uh, yeah so my plan to, in terms of agenda run through this the various sections of this document if anyone's got any comments um, you're looking at the document at the moment you may have it up on your on your other screen um, then uh, please do feel free to comment in the doc while we're talking it through um, or uh, otherwise I can comment in here um, or we, we, we'll uh, make notes and, and follow up afterwards um, and add those comments in then. Um, so without further ado then, just to start to talk about broken modes, which is what this, this uh, part of the document is. Uh, Nick, do you mm. want um, um, typos mentioned as well or is that something you don't care about at the moment? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you see anything, then do. Cool. I mean, yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, let's see if I make this slightly bigger. Uh, if I press this button, maybe. Uh, okay. So, uh, right. Sorry, I'm just seeing if I can make this. Uh, yeah, apparently, that's as big as it goes. Okay. Um, so we've got we've got this the concept of a seller broken and, and, and customer if you've been following this uh, Previously, you'll be familiar with these terms that they're, they're from schema.org um, the broker uh, which Ian has crossed out uh, lovingly <laughs> is uh, the uh, is the the uh, middle um, I don't cross it. it wasn't it wasn't deliberate. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I can, uh, Is that just, then, that? It's the suggestion that you put in here, so I'll just I'll reject your suggestion then. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. Sorry. That's all right. Um, and so. Uh, so the the broker is between the, the seller and the customer, and this conversation is that there's various ways that that, that works in terms of contracts and tax um, and different roles uh, that that broker can take. Uh, the two main roles are called reseller, uh, which is this diagram just here and the agent, which is this diagram here. Um, and so to kind of explain what's going on here with these two diagrams, um, the, the broker in the middle has to decide how the contracts work between the seller and the customer on either side. And, and so starting with the reseller, this is really the simplest one. In the reseller model, the reseller buys the thing, whatever the thing is from the seller, and then owns it. And then maybe a split second later, or maybe minutes later, or, or, or uh, weeks later, it will then resell that thing, uh, squash court or whatever it is, to the customer. And this is the kind of thing that happens when you have reserved theatre tickets um, that are, you're block booked by a tour company, and then they get sold on to the, the customers. But the, the main thing here is that as soon as they're booked, they can't be sold to anybody else because, of course, the, the reseller buys those. Um, Pay as you gym does this in some cases um, with some... Um, uh, with some providers. Um, it's more rare, I think uh, it would be fair to say, in, in, in what's likely to be the, the case with a lot of the trusts that we're working with for reasons I'll come to explain with tax. Um, but that's the, the principle of, of the reseller model. Um, and so then to explain the agent model um, as a comparison, so we've got that in our minds as well. The agent model, the way this works is that actually what the agent's doing is facilitating a relationship. So with the broker model, there was a, there's a clear, the agent is buying a thing and selling a thing. The contracts exist with the, sorry, with the, with the reseller, with the reseller in the middle, the, the contracts exist with that reseller. With the agent, the actual contract for the activity itself has nothing to do with the agent. 
It's, it's actually directly between the customer and the seller. And what this means is if the squash court's 10 pounds and the seller sells it for 10 pounds, the customer pays 10 pounds. Now it might be that there's a commission that happens. That commission is that right-hand arrow, um, but that commission is entirely separate. The customer doesn't see it. The VAT, it's separate for, for contractual purposes, it's separate. So it's a 10 pound transaction. All the agent's doing there is, is allowing that to happen. Um, legally, it's between those two parties. And then the, the last one of these diagrams um, is the, without, without a broker involved, obviously the customer can just buy from the seller, which we still need to support as part of the specification. But that's just to say that that is the supported. It's obviously quite straightforward because it's just a single relationship. Um, and we still need to consider it. Uh, Nick, um, with an agent relationship, does that mm. imply that the agent has to sell at the price the seller indicates? Um, the agent, um, I can go to the definition of an agent, which is quite handy here, is authorized to act on behalf of another and to create legal relations um, with, 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 the, with the customers on behalf of the seller and also to negotiate on behalf of the seller. So what that means is that the, the agent is given permission by the seller, although obviously it has to work within the parameters specified by the seller, to sell any of the, the things that the seller has for whatever price that they agree, um, which could be variable, it doesn't have to be necessarily what the, the seller is specifying on the website in our context. Um, but, but, but when the contract is, uh, is created, so let's say that they, a 10 pound squash court was reduced to five pounds because the agent had negotiated a, a deal with a, with a customer and the seller was happy with the agent negotiating that deal to five pounds. The agent would override that price from 10 to five, um, but the seller would then be, the contract would be between the customer and the seller. So the seller would be saying it's five pounds, the customer would be paying five pounds. Um, and that contractual relationship, that top arrow there would be for five pounds. Okay, and the, the, none of that money can stick. Well, that's not true. I'm just saying the, um, is a situation where the agent takes a cut before passing the money on to the seller, because in this case, the money is going to be taken by the broker, the agent broker, isn't it? That's exactly it. So, so the agent um, won't take a cut. Uh, that's, that's actually some quite interesting research. And actually, if you look at the way that Stripe and other, other things work, um, Stripe doesn't take a cut actually in that arrow either. Um, and so the way it works with, with taking a cut in inverted commas is that's actually a separate contractual relationship, which is called the internal contractual relationship between the agent and the seller. And what happens is that the customer pays £10 to the seller and then the seller pays whatever the commission is, two pounds to the agent. Thank you. Um, and so, and for, for the way that Stripe does this actually, so that you guys are aware if, if you if it look at Stripe's uh, tax or documents in there, um, the Stripe commission, actually the way it works is when you, when you pay 10 pounds to Stripe, the seller receives the 10 pounds in their Stripe account, that contract is fulfilled, 10 pounds for the seller. And then when the payout occurs in Stripe, which happens on a daily or weekly basis, um, the payout includes the other contract, which is this agent broker contract. Um, and it, it, reduce, it reduces the amount paid out to the, um, to the seller by that amount. And so if you've taken a two pound cut in inverted commas, there's a separate contract that is that two pound cut. And the money is deducted from the amount um, before it lands in the bank account of the seller. Um, but it's important to note that the Stripe account is still the property of the seller. So when the customer deposited £10 into the Stripe account, before any money was taken off, in, um, the, the £10 is the seller's £10 at that point. So from a VAT perspective and from um, a contract perspective, if there was any issues with that. Um, with, if, there was, you know, if the um, session didn't go ahead or if there was any liability involved um, or if there's VAT to consider, if there's a trust um, that is, 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 um, can, can have the 0% rate, is exempt from tax, um, then all of that still applies to the £10 because that's just a direct £10 payment to the seller from the customer. Um, okay, so so if, if basically if, if those two make sense, then I, I can talk through what we're proposing here to, to do in, in terms of the specification and what bits of this we're proposing to handle and not handle um, and, and how. Does, but does anyone have any more questions on the two different models before we talk about that?
Okay, all good. Um, so the proposal for the way that we would handle, let's start with the agent. Uh, the way that we would handle this is we would only, this, this specification would only cover this contractual relationship, at least in version one initially between the customer and the seller. Um, and that is a 10 pound squash court, um, which could be overridden, we'll talk about that later, to, to, to five pounds say, but whatever the number is that the seller is actually um, providing that for, that is vatable at that amount and that is contractually um, sold for that amount, um, that is what this specification would cover. There's a separate uh, transaction that occurs between the agent and the seller for, um, for the, any cuts or fees or whatever might be happening there for commission, um, which could happen in a number of ways. Um, it could be monthly, it could be at the way Stripe does it at the end of every day. And there's also another relationship between the agent broker and the customer where the agent broker might well actually have a, a one pound booking fee that it, it separately charges to the customer, which is again, not related to that. So it would, there'd be two um, on the customer's bank statement on the, on the credit card statement, there would be two transactions in that case, which is also possible. Um, but again, uh, suggest that that is actually not included in this uh, scope, primarily because in both of those cases, um, there are a number of different ways that those transactions can occur and be reconciled and they don't actually make any difference to the main transaction that's occurring here that we care about and need to reconcile into the booking system. And so what that means is that we can be, we can be quite straightforward about the way that this works. Um, so it means that we can do something like something like this to talk about tax uh, where basically we can say we can say we want to purchase a particular thing and the broker will give us the amount sorry the um the seller the, the booking system will give us the amount of tax that, that is related to that thing and then we can we can we can crack on and um and, and, and transact on that. But we don't have to worry about commission, we don't have to worry about anything else. It, and, and when the total is calculated, which is just down here, when the total is calculated, the total can be calculated again for that one arrow. It's 50, 50 pounds with 10% tax again. Don't worry about commission. That's just the amount that's registered in the system. Um, and, um, and so it makes that much more straightforward. We can talk about the detail of the tax bit of this in a, in a second, but just to give you that kind of flavor, it means that we don't have to put and none of these responses and requests need to have anything to do with commissioning at all. And of course, the other thing, uh, so, so... Sorry, Nick, can I have a bit of a quibble? Yeah, of course. In that example that you keep rushing past the screen, you've sure. got a VAT at 0% for the name, mm. but actually it's got a rate and a price, and that, that just was a bit potentially confusing. Ah yes, it's a very good point. This is this is an example which doing doing two things at once. That should be very much uh, twenty percent, shouldn't it, for that amount? Um, and the idea of that example there was to show that you could you could zero rate that if you wanted to, and you put the the reason why, which is the EU to EU um, business transaction. Um, the other thing I wasn't sure about this is you've got um, <coughs> for me you can have a number of what we call tax categories. So mm -hmm. in Canada, it'd be GST and HST and the STs. Mm -hmm. and those can have different rates depending on what the product is. Yeah. And I wasn't quite sure how that fitted into this model, uh, whether tax type was just tax charge specification, um, whether that was just, it literally was a type. So all of those things would be tax charge specification. And if that's the case, if we needed a unique identifier, um, because just having a tax description uh, is, uh, is weak. So you'd actually have a, a name for the code, a name for the rate, mm -hmm. and a name, uh, sorry, an identifier for the rate, mm -hmm. an identifier for the name. Mm. If you, th if, yeah, I, I, there's, there's, well, we've already got schema, schema supports that. So that is actually already in the schema. So it would be very easy to add. In fact, I can just do that now. Um, that would just be an identifier here. Um, and that's, that's already supported, but we haven't, we haven't made that uh, a requirement in here, but certainly it would be helpful for grouping things together. I, I, do you think we, we always have an identifier for every um, type of tax? Is that likely to be the case? 
certainly, certainly when you go outside the UK, I think that's fairly, I think that would be useful. In the UK, um, it's less critical. Um, I think Jersey might have some peculiarities there, but um, I'm not entirely sure. They certainly got different tax rates than we, than we have in the in mainland. Are these standardised, these identifiers, or are they likely to be custom per system? Custom per system. Great. Yeah, I'm judging by that, uh, Rain, that you uh, have identifiers also. Yes. The other thing which I was going to point out is um, if you are going to have um, tax at a line item level, uh, then you're probably going to want to follow the best practice guidelines from um, HMRC, which is to calculate tax to four decimal places. Uh, so that you don't get rounding issues. Mm. Great. You've also got to think about how to calculate tax when you've got quantities. So you've got two items here, and we're just going through a bit of an internal debate about this because it's not fully clear globally. Um, but it seems the best practice is to multiply the um, the unit price. I'm talking about net tax based uh, uh, countries here by the quantity. And then from that, work out the tax rather than work out the tax and the unit price and multiply that by the quantity. Ah, so we would rather this not be the unit tax spec, but actually be the item tax specification. To be perfectly honest, I'd rather you took independent advice on that. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 I mean, so looking at the, um, the VA, so I, I actually spent quite a bit of time reading HMIC's guidance because uh, we, uh, have, we've had so much input on this stuff thought it might be good to go to source and actually they have, they're very good they've got a, a page which uh, I'll just put bring up now which has got a, a bullet pointed list of everything that these things need to have in them uh, which is incredibly useful for a, for a VAT invoice whoops um, and so uh, in there it does talk about line items um, but it does say that they're not they're not required necessarily um, but it's actually got a HMRC actually do provide uh, what you can see here is a uh, uh, let me just pull that across the other screen sorry um, is a as a sample template which includes the columns for your ideal VAT return, and as you can see, they have indeed put the uh, total on a per line item level. So they calculated they've got the, they've got the quantity, then they've got the unit price, they've got the total, and then they've got the VAT. So it would yeah. be consistent with what they're saying. I was going to say some things uh, will have variable VAT rates or VAT exemptions, if I remember correctly, especially around um, if you're doing discounts for particular groups like children. Um, so I'm not sure how that would come out if you had it as a total VAT rather than a line item VAT. Uh, it's worse than that, actually. Uh, some items might have multiple rates of tax on them as well. So um, you might have um, a, a item that you're selling uh, which um, I'll just make one up off the cuff, which is £25. And of that £25, uh, £5 of it is taxable and the other 20 is not. <laughs> is this a, a per unit or per line item? Per unit. Right. Interesting. Ray, do you store it per unit or per line item? In uh, We store it... Uh, hold on a second. Text the source. I know that we store it with uh, up to four decimal places. Uh, I just need to check to see if the if hold on SQL Server is taking its time. If That's we right. store the unit amount or if it is the net amount. Okay, I'll put, while you're checking that, I'll put that comment in. Um, we'll see if we can. Um, yeah, if we'll definitely cooperate off two. Uh, We've got clarity and legend, and then maybe ask ask a third independent if there's a difference in that. Uh, and and sorry, Ian, you said you you were undecided about which legend is doing at the moment. Is that right? We're chasing down um, uh, international viewpoints on this. Uh, <laughs> yes, what we do might be changing soon as well. <laughs> okay, as so we take on international uh, influence, shall we say? Ah, that's good code. <laughs> Um, um, what was I looking for? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, with, a, with it sounds like the, the structure here is right. We've got name, price, currency, and obviously, and the other thing to mention is rate. So actually, the rate is is required. And there was some debate about this with various people, but the the, the guidance does include 
specifically um, the rate of VAT in the uh, list of things. I think you need to have an identifier for that as well, um, because you can have z exempt and zero rated, which are different VAT rates, even though it's the same amount. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So I suppose with, with this approach here, we can have the identifier, which can which can then be whatever the uniquely identifying the name and the rate. Yeah, but in, in the UK, we've got one type of tax, VAT, which can have in, in mainland UK three values, 20%, 0% exempt or 0%, 0%. See. And you have to report the exempt and the zero rated separately. Yeah. So yeah. I was I was assuming you would do something like this. Um, so you would put you would create the identifier to include. That's kind of all right, but then when you get to Canada, um, or the states, uh, you've got, um, you've got you've got effectively federal tax and and state tax, and alcohol tax, and the actual rate of those may depend on the item. So you've got types of tax, three different tax lines. Um, and then the actual rate of that tax may depend on what you what you're selling So you've got the type of tax and then the the, the rate mm. is a separate identifier within it Interesting, okay, so you could you could end up with something like this where you've got two uh, two identifiers one is for the uh, uh, Rate and one is for the type. Yeah Okay, interesting. Is that your experience as well Ray? Yes um, okay, so uh, what we're doing, um, we are storing the uh, unit amounts, uh, and I am just checking to see if this is a calculated or a stored field. Hold on one second, because um, we're we've got um, columns to four decimal places for gross amount, fat amount, and net amount. But I think the net is a calculated one, which just takes gross and subtracts fat. Um, but I'm just confirming that because I know we did have a number of rounding issues uh, and it might not be calculated anymore. Um, In the interest of honesty, since Ray's been honest with this group, uh, we don't necessarily actually do the calculation consistently. <laughs> 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 we, are, we, are, we are looking at that at the moment, as I said. So. Yeah, no, we, um, you know, we recently made a, made a big change uh, throughout the application, which is why all of this has been standardized. Um, right, so we store gross amount, uh, which is a unit amount. Uh, we store VAT amount, which is unit VAT, and net is a calculated column. Uh, so you do so you do have unit VAT and net uh, for the yeah, total. But, yeah, but net is only there as a as a as a convenience factor. It's not physically stored. It's actually Perfect. a great deal simpler in a gross tax environment than it is in a net tax environment, because you can gross up the uh, the total, twenty items at three pounds seventy six, and take off. Divide by 1.2. Yeah. That's right. Um, but if you're actually in a country which starts off with net tax, then it's more challenging with rounding errors. Yeah. So you've got to store yeah. the net and then gross that up before you add the tax. Yes. Ah, well, this is actually another question that I had. So one of the assumptions we've made here is that the um, the unit price specification must always be gross. <laughs> Now, is that is that universally true, or is it sometimes the case that the unit price, which is the uh, the offer price of five pounds, might be net? It is universally true, I'd say, here in the UK, but certainly outside of the UK, um, in the US and in Africa, um, it is not necessarily true. Interesting. So it might be that that we need to be able to set whether unit price specification is actually representative of net or gross. Correct. Because um, if it's a net price specification, discounting and tax combined starts to get horrible. Amen. <laughs> I've worked on um, several systems through the years which have been translated either to or from VAT from a GST setup, and it's always nasty. Goodness. So presumably we can't just if we did if we did have this as always gross in a net based system you couldn't just gross it and then work backwards no doesn't work uh, you get horrible rounding issues with the uh, when there's when there's random discounts applied and you know all sorts of promotional offers and things like that okay right um and just a, just a quick terminology question so previously i'd, I'd actually included in here um uh, the 
uh, there's a value added tax included property, which um, is already in schema. Um, but I don't know if anyone has any um, any opinions on this, whether value added tax, because sales tax is another type of tax, which is in the US. Value added tax seems to be in most countries in the in the world, but the US is a bit different. Um, does, does, this, does, does this term actually cover what effectively is net versus gross based? Or do we think it should be something different? to say net or gross? I would say that uh, for the avoidance of doubt, I would say that uh, we should not be using value added tax terminologies because that implies that it's all VAT specific and is not geared for a GST environment. Right, okay then. So we want a property that, expl that says net or gross basically that sits in the, are, they the, are they the words that we would use in the yeah. term? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Include a term in the unit price spec. I mean, okay. you know, I've just a just a thought out there rather than you know, rather than making this horribly complicated right off the bat. Um, you know, because this is primarily focused at the UK for now. It might be that that version one of this goes through with um, gross options only, and uh, a future revision adds in, you know, adds in all the support for other taxation systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so what I was, I, I guess, trying to understand here is that if 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 we include the type and rate identifier here, and we include gross and net as the two options obviously the calculations of what is supported by each system might be different because a system might refuse to support net if the setting is set. Um, but, but in terms of the way that the, um, the kind of fields, I suppose, are laid out, the properties here, um, would that cover net and gross? Uh, because in both cases, presumably there are tax line items that have amounts, that have rates, that have prices. And the question is more the back end of whoever's calculating these. Has that problem? I think if you're going to have uh, multiple tax specifications, you might as well make a distinction now. Um, I think if you don't have multiple tax specifications in the current, in the initial specification, it's going to be quite hard to change things later on. Um, I would think there's a fair chance we'll be um, supporting this in uh, America within the next year to year and a half. Yeah. So given the rate of progress of, of standards, um, I would prefer it that we got the thinking done straight away. Sure. OK. Well, I, I mean, just on, on that, then, if, if uh, I suppose that's the question, if when, when you guys have done your net based stuff, uh, is this I mean, this presumably these two things still work. You just have an item based uh, tax price and rate. It's just that the calculation happens the other way around. Is that right? Yeah, essentially. Give or take some foibles like rounding errors, as uh, Ray's already implied. Yeah. Yes. Sure. So if we put the price at the four decimal places, okay, great. And um, and then just so on these two, then it seems like they're the last two bits that we need to get right for the um, because rate seems pretty standard, price and price currency are already standardised. So with your systems, these two, which I know Ray, you mentioned, you also have. But what are you calling these? Hold on a sec. I think ours are called category and code. And I'm not allowed access to the database for things like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so what we've got uh, on our lines is a rate code. Uh, but that rate code is is where um, it is a richer item elsewhere in the schema, which has got the uh, the actual rate percentage and the type identifier on it and things like that. So, yeah. Ah, so you've got a single code that does it. Yeah, we have a single code, but uh, we would then have multiple codes exposing uh, all of the all of the different uh, all of the different permutations that you needed. Right. Okay. So it seems like, because that, that was what I was saying originally with this, just having one identifier and combining them like that, so you'd have a single code. Um, what's the value of having two rather than one? Ultimately, Ray's got his two identifiers. 
yeah they've got what, what i call the catching what i call the the code mm. um but there's one joined up identifier that will then point to both of those that's my understanding so i think behind the scenes there's two identifiers i could work with one like that uh, we would prefer two unfortunately <laughs> Does anybody else on the call, I know this has got into some level of detail here, but uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on one versus two uh, from anyone's experience? I'll tell, I'll tell you why I want to do that. Um, because you want to be able to aggregate the HST and the, the, the federal tax and the state tax. So if your identifier includes both, and, and that state tax might be 20%, 15% or zero, uh -huh. which is what we call the code. Uh -huh. So if you've got the identifier state tax, yeah, um, mm -hmm. then you can add up all the state taxes, regardless whether they're 10% or 14%. Uh -huh. Whereas if you aggregate those two into a, a dual part identifier, you've got to unpick them. And that means you've got to understand the internal logic of the identifier on a per, uh, per seller basis. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so it sounds like a useful thing to do. Um, so, in which case, we would uh, we could we could do two. I mean, that's just a okay. So, and and so the naming then you said uh, you've got category and code, and, and Ray, you had uh, all the two. Yeah, we only have a rate code. Right, is the one. Yeah, got it. Okay, great. Okay, sorry for getting into some detail here, everybody else. Uh, it sounds like we've we've got there. Um, so we've got some information and uh, I think I can see the advantage there, um, Ian, of what you're saying. I wonder how we, um, it would be good to have one more view on this just to kind of get a third steer. But I, I think you're right. If we don't have two, we can't do the aggregation that you're talking about. So it seems like more information might be better, but equally if that forces, I mean, Ray, Ray for example, if we had two, would you be able to work with that or because you've only yeah. got one? Yeah, we can work with two. Um, you know, one or two won't, it won't, you know, because on our rate, on our tax rate definitions, we have the, you have all the extra metadata anyway. Um, so this is just surfacing at one layer higher for me, really. Okay. Okay. Um, great. Right. So brilliant. So it sounds like we can do, we can do two. Um, uh, right. Back up then to the to the um, other parts of this, just to bring other people into the uh, conversation as well. Um, and we've already talked about price of the offers are, are not gross anymore, so I'll update that to be um, um, net versus gross. So we we, we talked about um, the contractual relationship between the customer and the seller. That would be what what it covers. Obviously, there's lots of different types of VAT in there. Um, the way that this is currently set up is that the VAT is calculated by the seller, by the booking system, which for innovators who might be uh, listening to this, thinking how on earth do we do this, uh, data users, well, uh, the booking system does it. So <laughs> you don't need to worry about that, um, which kind of makes sense because it's the seller's responsibility uh, to actually get those VAT rates right in this in this relationship. And obviously the booking system is the seller's um, system. And so um, it would be, it would, it would make sense uh, to put the responsibility there and obviously that's where a lot of the complex logic already lives as well um so i suppose is everybody happy with that in terms of responsibility and where that sits am i right in understanding sorry it's kent uh, am i right in understanding that both the agent and the reseller models will be in the spec it's just that the agent model this one that we're looking at now is the um easier option as it were for a um, agent or to a broker basically to implement because we don't have to work, worry about the tax is what you're saying uh, yes and that's right it, it's no. both, they're both in okay so what happens with um, the finances of it so if the money is taken by the agent and then passed on to the broker uh, onto the seller so it's taken by the, the agent broker via like the payment method that you'll have within the system and then passed on to the seller um and then a fee is taken off afterwards is there any complication with the agent holding the money in a basically in a basically a, a middle account as it were between the two is that going to cause problems with tax and so on so say we hold on to it for a week and then we pass it on to the seller 
is that going to cause any complications in that contractual relationship? Uh, yes, there's a there's a word for this, isn't there? A, the state of the money not being in either place. It's like a escrow account type escrow, thing. Escrow, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so my understanding um, uh, of of how this works with with other um, organisations as well. So, I'm looking at Move GB and their Move credits. In Move yeah. GB, you you purchase Move credits, and then those Move credits are used to pay for the um, activity. And so, the, the the taxable amount is actually the Move credit. Yeah. VAT. The VAT would be on Move credits. Um, and um, and using that as a small segue to a different point here, um, one of the um, the advantages of this approach is that if um, if when the VAT invoice is generated, um, that is actually generated by the broker. Um, sorry, generated is is sent by the broker. And if there was a different currency in use, like a like a move credit, the broker could then use that currency in their in their invoice, um, as long as the VAT amount is in sterling, um, at least in this jurisdiction. Um, that's that's all fine um, from a, a legal perspective um, okay. and so uh, all, all that to say um, that, that you might have you might have a problem if you're holding the money um, depending on your um, financial where that where, where that money is technically sitting because if you're technically if that's technically your um, pot and the money is being paid to you as an organization mm-hmm. um, then that would be a reseller set up but i think you probably need to in 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 either case i think the spec would support it because either you're an a, you're an agent like this contractually and the money's just for some reason you probably need to seek legal advice on that yeah. um it, it's okay that you can hold it um but, but i suppose if if not then you would be um you would be in this situation where the customer is effectively paying you for something and then you're independently paying the seller um and and just so for visibility the way the tax works in this situation is that you're you effectively have a B2B transaction between the reseller and the seller. Mm -hmm. And that incurs a tax, which would be probably 20% in a lot of the trusts that would otherwise be exempt for individual sales. Um, And then the uh, item then gets sold onto the customer as it would any other item again, because the reseller broker is unlikely to be exempt. It's not, it's unlikely to be a not-for-profit organization that um, meets all those exemption criteria. It would probably have to then charge tax on the same, on the VAT on the same in the UK. Okay, so uh, I, I'm kind of comfortable with the two models. It's, it's a technical question, I suppose, is the problem of when you have the customer with the contract with the seller and the payment goes via um, the um, via that not the reseller, the agent. Sorry, so the payment goes via the agent. Is how to deal with that, or is it that there's an expectation that the payment would go directly to the seller via a different payment mechanism? But then technically, that'd be very hard to implement. Well, so the way that Stripe does it is that the seller has the bank account. Uh, sorry, yeah. the Stripe account. And so it's with Stripe that when you when the customer pays the seller, it is it really is this model here. Yeah. Um, because and and that that's worked out because. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. It's it's, it's their account. Um, okay. Okay. So. Nick, you talked about move credits. I was not entirely sure I understood that. Um, so I can buy some move credits. We got some vouchers that you can do for that countdown voucher type thing. Yeah. So you've got uh, ten move credits and you've paid twenty pounds for them, of which four pounds, give or take, is tax. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, you get invoiced for that. That's the bill. Mm-hmm. Now I then come and apply my move credits to a move thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What what would what would that appear like? Because you know you're talking about that appearing as sterling, but in fact, um, there's no financial value in that in that transaction. Thank you for paying with your move credits. Um, well, so there there is a, a financial value if the cust- if the move credits are used to purchase from the seller, um, then there is a there's a monetary value of that. And if they are trying to use the tax exemption, then the customer purchase from the seller using the currency of move credits um, would still all the same be you know the customer purchasing directly from the seller. And so um, the way that would work is of course that the the um, the bank in this case, which is facilitating that, which is the move credits in the middle, which is, um, it's not really on this diagram, but that would be, um, the agent broker would be facilitating that bit of the transaction, like Stripe does, would be saying the customer in their account has this many move credits, they're being paid to the seller, 
um, for this um, amount of to, to buy a ten pound squash court. Um, now, obviously, they would need to have a conversion from move credits to pounds in order to purchase that thing from the, for the customer to purchase that from the seller, because it has a monetary value, um, and so it's that amount that would then be um, taxed. You see, the model we have for that is that what you're doing is you're effectively putting um, the word's gone from me already. Uh, you're, you're you're paying in advance into account receivable, so you've already accounted for the tax. Ah, uh, so that yes, that would be the case for a voucher with the seller, but this is because this is a voucher with the broker, and the broker is a separate organisation that's facilitating. Um, it, it's it's the the tax okay. because it, it's back to this the question yeah. about which one of these it is. Um, if if it's the case that they've purchased a, a, a voucher with the broker, and that is then um, can be can be spent with the seller as a separate transaction, and the broker does that, it's more like this. However, if the amount of money that's being given in, in, in move credits or whatever it is, is actually given to the customer to spend, then the customer can spend it with the seller directly, at which point they will, that's abatable. Um, because, the, because when they purchase the credits, they weren't purchasing them from the seller. You see what I mean? Whereas usually with vouchers, you would be. Yeah, but you've, you've bought it from the broker and the broker has already paid tax. They've paid that tax. You've got the four pound tax they've paid to the government already. Because you buy the vouchers, they buy the move credits in advance. Um, actually, I don't know if they do. Um, I don't know if you, I don't. I don't know if they do because if you're um, uh, there's a credits there's a credit section of the tax stuff which I think says that you uh, don't you do not adjust the price. So I, I think basically you don't you don't need to charge uh, if it's just a conversion between currencies. You're not actually buying anything, provided the monetary amount's the same. Um, so you don't charge fat when you buy the credits. I believe that's the case. I suppose okay. that's yeah. Uh, separate, <clears throat> separate point to clarify. But then I guess it does, if it doesn't, don't know if that affects the um, the specification necessarily. Although it's good to. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, let's move on from that. I, I don't really understand this, but I'm sure that. Uh, uh, I don't understand it, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I'll, I'll seek to get some clarity on that particular point um, in, in regard to where the tax works with, with the credits and just to check that, that this supports it. Um, yeah. Sorry, really quickly before uh, we move on. Did I, um, did you say that if the uh, broker holds the money in escrow, mm -hmm. um, then that might count as a um, reseller relationship? Sorry if I misheard you. Well, that was the question. We weren't we weren't sure about the answer for that. Do you do you know anything? Yeah. So, so it doesn't really matter what happens to the money as long as it's accounted for correctly. Um, so the, um, uh, the the agent or the agent like uh, my local pitch can hold the money on behalf of the um, the the seller. Um, as long as VAT is accounted for in the right way, we can then pass the money on to the seller and still act as an agent. So mm -hmm. just because the money comes via us, um, that doesn't make us a reseller, um, as long as it's accounted for correctly. So for example, what that means for our VAT returns, and we've just had a bad audit, so this has all been signed off by HMRC, um, we very often will hold the money in escrow for our customers, um, uh, for the operators, and then pass it on on a monthly basis. Um, and that's still fine. We just we account for all of those transactions as no VAT. Um, the, um, the, um, uh, the operator then just uh, accounts for their side as having VAT. If you see what I mean. That's really great. That answers your question, Kent. Yeah, it does. Yeah, okay. I was slightly concerned, so uh, that's back more in where I thought was was the right answer. I was getting a bit concerned by this conversation. I was making notes to go away and do some checking, so thanks for that. No, you, I mean, you can really do what you want with the money as long as you account for it correctly. It doesn't matter what account it goes into or out of. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Perfect. So the primary difference between these two is less the flow of funds. But more the the contractual setup with 
when when the thing's been bought by who. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and so um, there's a, another point then to just move us on, if we can, just to cover the last couple of points on this. So um, there's a few other bits of this which are interesting. One is that you can. Um, I'm just trying to find the, the bit that's related. So the tax for organisations and individuals. Um, so if you're an organisation and you purchase um, something, you will potentially um, be liable for different VAT, different tax to if you're an individual. And the way that works in the spec is that currently you um, pass the type of organisation as a customer with the information about that organisation, which includes uh, the address and the VAT number. And then you can be taxed accordingly um, by the, the booking system. And so if there's different rates to apply, there's it's effectively a switch on this property, which is the organisation or the person. Nick, uh, if I'm correct, and I'm probably out of date on this, this is an optional thing. So if you have a, a, a good relationship with the, uh, between the seller and the buyer, and they're both organisations, you can optionally not charge VAT because it's effectively accounted for when they make the sale. But I don't think there's anything to stop you actually charging the VAT. Um, the only benefit of that really is just reduces the bookkeeping lot when you've got a large number of transactions as a big business. So I'm not sure if we have to do this. Uh, and there's a lot of internal complexity because then we've got to, um, it, within the booking system, know which organizations we've got the agreement with that we, we therefore don't charge tax to. Um, and in terms of the, the money that flows, it doesn't really make any odds because ah, it, doesn't, I, I it doesn't go to the some of it just some of it doesn't go to the uh, um yes government so, straight away I, I actually yes what you've just said i wasn't even aware of but you're you're right that's probably something else um what this is this is actually talking about is that um for example if a person is generally vat exempt with a particular uh trust for example a charitable trust um they would be charged usually at an exempt, an exempt rate zero percent uh, so they they don't get charged for the squash court. If a business purchases that squash court, or or five aside, for example, um, then they would be charged because they're a business and they don't have that VAT exemption. So so this was just to say, if you're an organisation, you probably, as you say, always get charged VAT. If you're a person, then if there's some VAT exemption already in place, then that stuff applies. But you, you've actually just said there that there's some situations where organisations, if there are certain organisations don't get charged VAT because there's an arrangement between them, which is, uh, I, I guess, an additional step further as well. Uh, okay. Um, I am not convinced that we support that. In other words, if we do support that, but only for, only through manual processes. So right. in other words, um, you would see, you know, if we got block bookings, for example, for uh, IBM, yeah. um, or uh, IBM are also my go-to example, I don't know why, big company. Um, then th there are circumstances when you do or do not charge tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also depends on what you're selling because it depends on the quantity of things you sell. So it gets really complicated. Mm. And I, 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 I don't think that we would find it very easy to manage this internally. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fairly sure we don't support it at the moment. Um, and I don't, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, mm -hmm. Saying not as a mandatory item. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anyone else has got experience of this. Looking at Ray, of course. Um, the only bit I would weigh in is that uh, on, uh, <clears throat> similar to what you're saying, Ian, uh, what we tend to do is um, if it is a pre-canned product that you're trying to sell, then there's a preset uh, VAT rate um, with that product or VAT rates, I should say, um, which will then be applied to everybody buying their product. Uh, when it's a block booking, however, um, there is more of a manual process or, or a manual intervention where they can override what, what particular VAT rate applies um, for that one particular block booking. So we don't necessarily have any massive uh, rules within the, within the application at the moment, which has a look at the type of person that you're selling, sorry, the type of entity that you're selling to, and then tries to vary the VAT uh, based on the entity that you're selling to. I will say though, in past experience with GST uh, type environments, um, the VAT exemption uh, 
very definitely does come down to the type of entity uh, or the specific entity that you are dealing with as to whether or not you need to mess around with the um, tax on that particular sale. Um, unfortunately, tax gets horribly complicated no matter mm -hmm. which way you look at it. Um, I would also say that this uh, this whole thing uh, does get further complicated when you uh, talk about countries where they have um, fiscal monitoring devices uh, on all the tills uh, and you know, and also e-commerce processes uh, because uh, any tax calculations that the seller calculates uh, in some way or form need to be uh, recorded to fiscal devices uh, and then need to correspond uh, with what was actually charged and things like that. So it gets uh, a lot harder for you to do the VAT in, VAT out bypass that was mentioned earlier. Right. Well, that might answer the, the, the last question I had on overrides then. So, um, I, so Sorry, I, can we just go back to that one? Mm. Um, my view is we shouldn't do this. Yeah, I, I hear that. So this, this, this whole thing about organizations and individuals um, shouldn't be in this version, basically. That would be my viewpoint. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what the uh, other sides of the, you know, the, 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 the consumers think about this, but um, I think it's a step too far, to be honest. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's um, in this iteration, just not, not something it's going to be engaged with right away. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. That sounds good. Let's, let's, let's get rid of that. Um, so um, last uh, quick point in two minutes then is this price overrides. So um, I'm actually going to add to this uh, slightly given the last conversation. So this is just basically saying if, if there's price variability going on, if the uh, agent or the reseller um, has uh, been given the permission to change and override the prices commercially, um, they can do that. They can just put a price override in, uh, a unit price override, and then the booking system can take that and apply all the tax rules it would otherwise have applied to the same exact unit uh, and um, and just uh, reduce the tax uh, amount. And then um, that would be effect, that would then affect the total. Um, so, that, so I guess there's two things. That's what we previously discussed. But I almost also wonder whether it would be useful, but maybe that's not something for now, to also allow a tax override so that we can do basically the manual things that we talked about? Um, or do we think that actually overriding tax within systems is more complicated than just calculating it and we, we don't want to do that now? Are you saying that you provide a, a price override and the, bro and the um, booking system, the seller, tells you what the tax will be? Uh, that's the current proposal in here, yeah. Because I don't, what I don't think we should do is to allow the broker to calculate the tax if they're providing an override, um, because I wouldn't trust them to do it consistently. Yeah. No disrespect, gentlemen, by the way. Uh, no, I would say that um, there are f there are too many things involved uh, for for them to to reliably do it accurately um, in terms of um, if you've got if you've got line items which have got multiple rates of tax on them, like the one I gave earlier, where it is where it is uh, a total price of 25 pounds, but five pounds of it is taxable and the rest isn't or vice versa. Um, I would not want uh, a, a third party being responsible for how to work out that split. That sounds clear to me. Um, so uh, no tax override. Uh, uh, I think that's, that makes sense. Uh, great. Okay, so we've we've hit time. Um, one more one more thing. I, I was going to um, try and squeeze in, which is the last, literally the last page. Is Sorry, Nick. Um, just to you know, just about to, and the one thing I would also say that uh, needs to just be clear in this document is that the unit price overrides are using the same scheme that the that the that the offer price is using. So if your so if your offer price is is gross specified, then the then the unit price override should also be gross, and if it's net based then it should be net based as well yeah that makes sense so it should be very trivial to uh, to calculate from the booking system Correct. perspective um okay great um so the last thing then um is this just just this really quickly this one thing which is um to allow for custom items to be added to the basket which are just line items um the idea here was to allow for for discounts to be applied um by the broker uh, again, if, uh, if there was agreement with the um, 
the seller that that was something that they would be happy to do. I hate um, this. Sorry, I said I'd go, but I can't. <laughs> if, you're, if you've got multiple items in the basket and you're applying a 5% discount, a £10 discount, there's then the whole problem of how do you allocate that across the items in the basket? Yes, yeah, so there's, that, there's an allocation problem with this. Yeah, uh, I don't like this. There is much more problem with this. Um, right, in that um, there is no way for us to report on this revenue correctly in uh, ledgers because yeah, right. we don't have GL codes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, okay, it's gone. That can be handled out of band if there's any any issues like that. I think I think that's the only thing I I've got. To, I really do have to go before listening to your answer to this. But I didn't really understand the comments you were making about VAT receipts, tax receipts. So a bit of clarification on that, but I, I, I'm sorry, I do have to go now, so my apologies. No problem. Thanks so much, Ian. Absolutely. Yeah, Ian. Um, okay, so uh, we, uh, I think we've, we've kind of got most of this now, and, and we've, we've obviously hit our time box as well. So um, there is a, a little bit of clarification we need to do um, to just amend some of these things. I can put those in the next document uh, that we, we, we send out. Um, I think we've got enough information to to do that um uh so that's been really really helpful the last last thing ian mentioned which he's right we didn't cover with was tax receipts by email which was the suggestion here is to discourage um the booking system from sending tax receipts and instead to have the agent uh send those um so looking around at different systems that do this um most things like uh pay to gym or booking.com there's only one receipt, one email that you get, and it's usually from the agent. You don't usually get two emails. Um, and obviously when there's lots of different organizations involved, it could get quite confusing what that second email looks like and if it ties together with the first. So I initially started writing a big spec for how to tie the emails together. Uh, then when the more you look at it, the more you realize actually that it's probably not necessary. And so the proposal here is to actually just not not have an email from the booking system and for the agent to be the one that sends the email with all the details of the VAT details which are included um, well specified in, in here. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, I think, so, so, so your point is that um, the email shouldn't be handled by the agent, sorry. No, the email should be handled by the agent. It should sorry. not be handled by the booking system. Uh, yes, that's that's right. That's how I would interpret it. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I I would agree that the final receipt that the customer receives should be the person that they've been dealing with, i.e., the the agent. Um, my concern here is uh, whether or not uh, that meets proper tax legislation. Um, in that, um, if you have taken monies, um, you should in, in theory, produce some form of receipt. Um, I just don't know what we would do with that receipt. So the idea is that the, the receipt is provided in a digital form through the um, response, the JSON we've been looking at, and that the uh, that can be rendered or and must be rendered. I think that's what it says here. Um, that the must be rendered um, as either an email confirmation sent from the broker to the customer or by accessible via means of logging into the broker's system and, and getting it that way. Um, and from what I've read on, um, in, on the HMRC stuff, it looks like as long as the uh, VAT receipt can be retrieved within 30 days on request, um, or indeed um, is, uh, is available from the seller, um, which it would be, I suppose, uh, then, and, and any VAT uh, receipt that's produced includes the uh, VAT, uh, number and a few other items uh, which I think are also specified in here somewhere Th then that should be fine um, yeah um, yeah I would say that that sounds fairly reasonable um, the only uh, the only little asterisk that I'd like to put there is um, outside of the UK there are some countries which have got fiscal memory devices which I mentioned earlier mm. so seller is going to need to lodge something with some form of fiscal fiscal device and that's normally a receipt that is quote unquote sent to the customer right okay and so that's where we might we might need to basically ensure that whatever's in this json gets rendered very exactly into whatever email gets generated uh yeah those you know those fiscal memory devices are a are a real pain to work with 
because um, you need to import all your line items with all their VAT breakdowns and everything like that. And in the case of a fiscal printer, for example, um, it has the layouts quite firmly defined within the printer itself. You don't send it a print job, you actually upload to it a journal entry of, of the sale and then you say, please print this for me. And it will use its own layout information to actually format it properly on the printer. Goodness, quite similar to this then. Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's how things work like, for example, in Italy, um, where they've got fiscal printers and all that sort of stuff there. So. Very interesting. Uh, okay, so it sounds like it sounds like well, there might be an issue there in terms of making sure the, the, the stored amount, what's stored in that printer, is the same as uh, what's been issued. Um, but providing that that is uh, the same, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and the, this is it. So, include sale details and tax receipts. So, for the United Kingdom, the name, legal name, VAT ID, and address properties are all required. So the booking system would need to include this big blob of JSON with at least those mandatory fields, name, legal name, VAT ID address, in order that the that information could be rendered into whatever email receipt was sent. Um, yep. Okay, so, sounds, so it sounds like we've got agreement on that, uh, just as you say, Ray, that we need to make sure that if there's any, if in the future, those situations arise where there needs to be something that's uh, saved somewhere that that can work out. I mean, it might be that in those cases, the two emails are sent, but maybe for the, for now we have one email sent and then we can revisit it when we've got international problems, uh, as it were. Because I mean, I suppose it, it should, if we set this up like this, it's trivial for an extra email to be sent because actually it makes no difference at all to anything here. Um, it might not, it might look a bit weird and it might not be totally joined up, but uh, at least it would, it would work. And then we, we could always add more content in here to join the two together somehow if we were trying yeah. to. Okay, amazing, great. And anyone else got any final uh, comments or thoughts before we wrap this up? Sorry for going on uh, a bit longer. Uh, seems to be a no. Um, okay, great, right. Well, what I'll do then, we'll go we'll make these changes. Oh, sorry. Okay, we'll, we'll make these changes, uh, net and the gross and all of that good good stuff in there, put these codes in as well. Um, and then um, we'll remove these sections to do with organizations um, directly uh, being um, uh, charged. So that's, that's, that's there, that'll, that'll be gone. Um, that does leave a slight inconsistency with the um, reseller because the reseller is an organization that's purchasing um, reseller broker, um, but that, that might just not be a problem for now if um, uh, the system needs to handle that. I guess that's something that can be figured out at the implementation stage. Um, but we'll go through. We'll go, I'll go through and, and make those amendments and reduce reduce the the size of it, which is always good. Um, and uh, yeah, next step will be to get that out into a, a final spec. I will highlight the changes I've made in that spec, um, and hopefully that's us done. If we need to do any more iterations on it from that point, then that's great. We can have another call. Uh, to do that in the new year um, but if everyone's happy with it we can we can then um, uh, crack on um, and start to implement so thanks so much everybody um, really appreciate your time and have a good Christmas uh, if we don't speak again before then <laughs>